Today, I face my nemesis. As we make, As we make a we peach make. Mead. 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 If I sound kind of angry, it's because I've never made a good peach mead. Never made a good peach wine. Nothing. I need to put out positive energy, not negative energy. This is going to be great. This is going to okay. be the best mead ever. I'm hoping. We are going to be doing it backwards style. That doesn't mean that you're only going to watch the backs of our heads. It just means we're going to do it a little differently, but we'll get to that. So first. Honey. This is a mead, which means we need honey. For that, we're going to be using Kirkland Costco honey. Why? Because it's, it's inexpensive and yeah. really good. And honey is really expensive right now. Yeah. So for this particular mead, we're going to be using three pounds of honey. Why do I use three pounds of honey? Because it puts us very close to my perfect number of 1.100 original starting gravity, which usually ends up with about 13% or so ABV. By the way, all that foam and stuff coming out of here is because everything's been sanitized in. Also known as a red bucket over on the side filled with star sand solution mixed with water according to the manufacturer's suggestion. We just put okay, everything in there. I'm going to tear it because it just, it's yep. confused now. There. Okay. Now, three pounds of honey. When you're doing it this way, just remember honey does not flow super fast. So you might want one person watching the jar and another person watching the honey and another person watching the scale. So yes, it takes three people to do this. It takes a village. Okay, so we have our honey in the fermenter. Next, we're going to add some water. Now we still have a bunch of honey in our funnel and that's why we're gonna add some honey, some water now, because so that's gonna help rinse out our funnel. We are gonna be adding a total of 96 ounces of water because three pounds of honey is roughly 32 ounces, almost exactly 32 ounces actually. And I'm just gonna pour some of this in, trying to rinse out that funnel, like she said. <laughs> what? See the like honey. Yeah, <laughs> the, the two lines. <laughs> and now I only put in about half because I want to mix this up. Um, so I need my um, thumb saver bong. Your thumb saver bong. I need to find out where the heck I put that thing. What she means by my thumb saver bong is it just doesn't have a hole in it. So that way, when you put your thumb over it, it doesn't, you know, poke your thumb through that little tiny hole and hurt after a while. So I only fill it halfway because it's much easier to do this to shake the bejesus out of it. The trick is, if you uh, have it totally full, there's not a lot of air in there to help push things around, so it's much, much better to um, half fill it and then do this. Also, at this stage of brewing, aeration is good. You want oxygen in your must, so that way when you put your yeast in there, they have something to work with. They require oxygen in order to reproduce. So now we want the oxygen, but once they start doing their job and start fermenting, creating alcohol, we don't want oxygen. Exactly. Now, um, for those of you wondering, if you wanted to make three gallons, five gallons, 17.2 gallons, whatever, you can scale this up to the number of gallons you're making. Everything scales except for the yeast. We're gonna be using a whole packet of yeast. Just use a whole packet of yeast up to five gallons. Should be just fine. Everything else does scale. Also, for those of you who may be confused, this is a U.S. gallon, which is different. 3.785 liters. Imperial gallon. We know this, comma, however, we love the U.S., so we're using a U.S. gallon yeah. because I mean, that's do what I we sound have British? Because that's what we have available to us. But do I sound British? People ask all the time, is that a U.S. gallon or a British gallon? I'm like, do I sound British? <laughs> no, no offense to anybody that's British, just do I sound like I live in England? <laughs> Ugh. Okay, my general rule of thumb sucks, but it is when you think you're done mixing, mix more. Mix for two more minutes. You're gonna have to mix some more when you put some yeah, more. Yeah, I know. As you can see, the color has changed because more oxygen is in there, and that's a good thing. So, we wanna get more water in there. We're not gonna put all the water in yet, though, because I do have a plan. Okay. Well, we are going to put all the water in eventually. So my idea is this. We're going to talk about a couple of things that I want to add to this brew, but I want to just put some of this water in. Okay. Honey is not really the greatest nutrient-dense food for yeast, okay? It does like nutrients. We have had some issues where we might not have nutriented enough. Sure. We didn't add enough nutrients. 
to the brew. I don't know how to say that properly. So one of our audience members suggested adding a lot more nutrients. And one of our VIP members actually tried this. And other people have been telling me that, yeah, they use a lot more nutrients than what we call for, and it works great. And they didn't have any off flavors. Now, when I say yeast nutrients, I mean Fermade O. If you're using Fermade K, different story that has DAP in it, diammonium phosphate. So adding too much will actually affect the flavor uh, and not in a good way. So we are using Fermade O, which is the organic version. And I have 10 grams diluted in a little bit of water here, but it's not breaking up really nicely. Yeah, so I'm going to pour mess. it into this pitcher and rinse this guy out to get all the uh, nutrients in there. Come on, just what I do. I'm, I'm really good at making messes. Okay. <laughs> I need to get you one of those Game of Thrones t-shirts that says I, I make messes and know things. I have, a, I, have a, I have a glass that says I drink and I know things. Yeah. Um, something else that I want to add to this is wine tannin. Now, this can be done one of two ways. Well, several ways. You can use an actual powdered wine tannin, which ours is just essence of oak. And I'm going to be using half a teaspoon for the amount that we're making. Yep, half a teaspoon for, per gallon. Or if you really wanted to, and you want to just keep it as natural as possible, you can just make a cup of strong black tea, one tea bag. The amount of water that you use doesn't actually matter because it's going to be dispersed through the whole gallon anyway. But just do like eight ounces of water, one tea bag, steep it properly. If you oversteep, it'll be bitter and it could affect flavors. I say black tea because it has the most tannins in it. But if you wanted to use a flavored tea, you can just know it's going to change the flavor of this mead, which may or may not be a good thing. Okay, so for our purposes, I'm keeping it simple. And I just want to give this a good swirl around here to mix that up so that I get everything out. Because 10 grams of Fermate O doesn't want to dissolve really, really easily. And the wine tannin, same thing. So may I have a stirring implement, please? Yes. Now, part of why I'm doing it this way is because a few people have asked recently, how come you don't just mix together the yeast nutrient and the wine tannin and the pectic enzyme and yeast and all that together before you put it in? And it's a really good question. And my, my honest answer was, because I have to do separate steps so I can show you guys how to do it. That was the real reason. So I thought, you know, mixing it into the last bit of the water, not a bad idea, especially since we know how much water we're going to be using. She's gonna do the notes. Apparently I suck at it. So while I'm mixing this up, let me talk to you a little bit about water. The quality of water that you use actually makes a huge difference. And we don't talk about it often enough. We had been using reverse osmosis water for years. We have the reverse osmosis system in our house, and that's the water we were using. We did not have a remineralizer, which I learned might have actually improved it slightly, but it came time for a possible replacement of our system, and we looked around and said, you know what, there might be a better option. And that better option was a Berkey water filter. We actually bought the six gallon version, and that's what we're getting all of our water from. I can taste a difference in my coffee and just drinking water. I taste a difference, and it lasts a long time. We should get about five to six years out of the filters in the Berkey, which is amazing. And I just refill it almost every day, and um, we just, that's where our water comes from. So it does make a difference. Use the best water you can get. Um, if your tap water tastes really good and doesn't have much chlorine flavor or smell, use that. Otherwise, you can buy drinking water from the store. You can get a water filtration system. I mean, we can put a link to the Berkey in the bottom of this video. Um, I will warn you, they are not inexpensive, but they are basically maintenance-free and extremely cheap to operate. So there is that. Um, but I'm mixing all this together. The last thing we want to put in is... Yeast. Today's yeast is Cote de Blanc by uh, Red Star. Red Star. One of those. <laughs> and um, it's a plastic foil packet. So I have to do that. Thankfully, someone got me left-handed scissors, so I can just reach over and get that. So Cote de Blanc's preferred fermentation temperature range is 64 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is right in range of what we keep our house at. So We're usually right around 74 to 78 degrees right. Fahrenheit. And its ABV tolerance is 12 to 14. Which we're gonna be around 13. So this may finish a little bit on the sweet side and that's perfectly okay because we'd probably end up back sweetening this a little bit anyway. Peaches should be sweet after all. Now you might be wondering, where's the peaches? That's the backwards part. We put them in later. Don't worry. It's not gonna be peach juice either. No peaches. Actual peaches. 
I have found or learned or been told by several people that using fresh peaches or frozen peaches in the, in the instance that we're doing actually is the way to go versus using peach juice or concentrates or anything like that. So that's the way we went. You notice I threw the yeast in here too because I want to mix it through. I want to make sure everything is homogenous. And it's not. See, there's chunks and stuff everywhere. And yep, that's why we mix. So we have gone ahead and purchased our fresh peaches and processed our fresh peaches. And by that, I mean that we washed them off real good. And then Brian pitted them and cut them into about roughly that size. Like one inch, uh, one inch cubes. Yeah. And then we put them in a two gallon zip top bag and stuck those in the freezer. One downside to doing it this way, we do have to make sure that all the solids are in solution. Some of them don't want to play nice. Probably did get a little extra aeration in here because of this. And you also want to make sure that you measure properly. Yeah, see? Look at that. Whoops. <laughs> like I said, I'm good at making messes. What I want to do now, though, is get a reading on this. This should, would be our original gravity reading. But before I do that, I probably need to mix this up just a little bit more. So just give it a little shake a rooney. I never say that. Shake a rooney. Be careful when you remove the bung. They tend to have a little pressure in there and they spit at you. And um, there's a million jokes that people try to make in the comments about that. It's a family show, people. Family show. Okay, so I'm just going to take a reading. And it's perfectly okay to take your reading with the yeast in there. Um, there was an old idea that it's not. And I think that comes from people taking the reading like hours later or days later. If you take it right away, it's fine. The yeast haven't had a chance to do anything yet. They're, they're not really converting yet. They're still playing the happy dance of love at this point. We were looking for something like a 1.105 and we're gonna settle for 1.098. So really, really close to our target original gravity. Had I added just a little bit less water, we probably could have got there or a touch more honey. But honestly, those seven points are meaningless. They mean nothing. I'm just gonna pour this right back in. That foam could be an issue because as this starts to ferment, it could push that up into the airlock and make a bit of a mess. If that is to happen, we will switch it over to a blow off tube, which is literally just, I take the same airlock bung, put a piece of tubing in it, run it out to a mason jar filled with sanitizer fluid. No problem, do that for a couple of days, and then we can put the airlock back on. We have a video on that. I'll put that link in the description below. But now can we get uh, an airlock? So it seems like every one of our fermenters is just a little bit slightly different in size, and none of our bungs seem to fit. So we just put a rubber band on there to hold it in place because we're cheap and don't really want to have to buy a whole new set of bungs and or fermenters to go with. What are we going to do with this now? We're going to put this on a lift tray. So just in case it decides to get extra happy, the lift tray will catch that mess rather than the floor of our kitchen. And then it's going to ferment. And once the airlock activity slows down to basically nothing, we'll be back to show you what we do next. Sorry to interrupt the video, but I wanted to tell you about the City Setting VIP Club. It's a super friendly bunch of brewers who get together and constantly help each other and share information. A large part of it is our private Facebook group where you can ask questions and get help. We also have Zoom meetings monthly for most tiers of membership. These hangouts are a great way to ask questions or just hang out with us and the other members. In addition, the higher tiers get their names right in our videos. So, consider becoming a VIP. Now, back to the video. It's been a little over two weeks. Time to check this thing. See how it's doing. I was just very violent with it. There was no reason for that. How you doing? <laughs> Brian hates it when I do that. <laughs> it's a little cringeworthy. <laughs> I think I just got a whiff of it. It's dry, I'll tell you that which is good. We actually want this to go dry so that we can sweeten it to taste later, which is kind of the idea. It seems to be really orangey in color. Whoa. Fill it to the Filled rim. Fill it to the rim with brim. Anybody remember that commercial? I, I do. I think I... We were like six. Yeah. 0 0.996. Bang! <laughs> That's good. That means this fermented really, really well. But we don't consider this finished yet. We want to give it one more week just to make sure. And I'm just going to pour the sample right back in. Very carefully. Yep. You don't want to splash. It's 
probably still pretty gassy in there, so not a huge worry, but. Do you want to give it a preliminary swirl before we put the airlock? I don't normally like to swirl at this point, but I will just a little bit to get some gases flowing. Push out any oxygen that might have come in, though in reality, it's not likely. But yep, it's gassy. Let's see, I put the airlock right yeah. back on after he did that, so that way we can make sure that I am going to swirl safe. this a little bit more and try to degas it some more. Just be careful, um, it's a little sticky and we don't want to... It's not a safety thing at this point, it's I'd like to degas this and see if it actually ferments anymore. Um, just to give it the best we can. Wow, that's, yeah, it's pretty gassy. That's pretty gassy. So when you do this at this point and you have your airlock on, you want to make sure that if you have a partner, they're watching the airlock so they can tell you... <laughs> when you've gone too far. Calm down <laughs> because you're exploding. Yeah, you can really force everything out of the airlock yeah. and make a mess. Yeah. I'm just trying to get some of the gases out. They are waste products for the yeast, so they can prevent it from going further. Do I really think it's going to go much further at 0.996? Do I even care? No, not really. But we always say, wait a week, you know, check it, wait a week, check again. So we are following our own advice. There's nothing wrong with letting this sit, okay? We can let this sit for another month before we check it again. But we like to get videos out to you guys, so we're going to check it in a week because there's still more to be done on this particular brew. Right, because right now it's just a mead. Right. A mead without the peach. Right. Next time, we're going to have peach. See you in two seconds. Okay. It's been a week. We had a 0.996 last time. Let's see. Did we beat it? <laughs> doubt it, I but doubt it too. <laughs> we, we checked just because. It is clearing nicely, though. Yeah. The yeast cake looks like a moonscape. I love it that. It really does. 0.996. All right. So that means our brew is finished fermenting. But wait. There's more, because this is supposed to be a peach mead, and we don't have any peaches in here. I also want to know how much alcohol we made, because, you know, that's the question everybody wants to ask all the time. So I got the calculator the teacher said I would never have handy. It was right there in my pocket. And this is a very simple formula. It's 1.098 minus 0.996 gives us 0 0.102 of gravity used, times 135 gives us 13.77% ABV. Now, here's the thing. We're going to be adding some fruit to this, so it's going to dilute it a little bit. It's going to be difficult to really know the final alcohol of this, but suffice to say, it's not going to drop by more than a point or two, which means it's still over 10%. We're still safe when it comes to vinegarization and preservation. We also use Cote de Blanc, which I believe, oh, it has an ABV range of 12 to 14. So we're, we're smack right there, middle to high end. Mm -hmm. So... It probably won't re-ferment. It re probably won't re-ferment, but it could. Now, I had originally thought we were going to pasteurize this and then add the peaches. And I thought, I we're so necessary. close to yeah. the tolerance that I don't think we need to. And if it fermented a little bit, that's okay. We can always sweeten when it's done. So, in order to do that, we need to get some peaches into there. I'm going to put this in here. I should have tasted it. Although it's just straight meat right yeah, now. It's just... We know what it tastes like. <laughs> Let me go get the peaches. What we have here is 5.5 .5 pounds of cubed peaches, no pits, that were frozen. And our bag apparently has a hole. These bags always have holes. Yeah. I don't understand how they're supposed to be freezer bags. That's why you put it in a bowl. Who cares? Put it in the freezer, it's not going to leak. It's obnoxious. I don't like it. It's right. angry. So, Arr. to make life easy, what I'm going to do is make a mess. take the end, the open end, and stick it in the fermenter. Sort of. Like that. There's a hole right there in the bag. I felt it. Oh, uh, yep, there's a hole right there. There's actually a hole in the bag. The Who heck? knew? Okay, and then the rest of this juice. You like it a juice. <laughs> Put that right in. And now is the tricky part. To get this into here without oxygenating our brew, which means I'm going to have to cram the end of my siphon tube all the way past all these fruits down to the very, very bottom. I and, think you can do it. and volumes there. is a thing. So we're, we're going to find out if this is going to work or not. <laughs> it's going to work. Worst case, we'll have a little bit extra plain old mead to drink. I am totally okay with that. All right. I, I have accomplished scooching 
to the bottom. I left the cap on because there's the moonscape at the bottom here. Yeah. I'm only going to go about halfway down and get it started. Now, we intentionally switched to the little big mouth bubbler because we know it's 1.4, really it's 1.5 gallons. This is one gallon. So assuming we only had about a half gallon of peaches, because, you know, air spaces, gaps, that sort of thing, hopefully. But I'm going to wash it really carefully because I don't want this on my lap. Yeah. <laughs> so there was some concern as we were doing this. I actually had a pitcher. Ready I was to go. Holding, like, ah. It went right to there. But there's barely anything left in here. So I'm really not worried. We got everything out of it that we wanted. We're going to end up with a, pretty much a full gallon when this is done. Okay. So now we're going to put the lid back on and then airlock back on. And it's going to go in the fermentation station and sit for a couple of weeks. That's a lot of peaches. I have a question that... I, we didn't talk about before filming. Do peaches have pectin? They have some. But they're not overly pectiny? y um, I don't know. I haven't looked it up, but I think they do. Why? <laughs> do you want to add pectic enzymes? I was just curious if we want to do that to get more of the sugars out of the peach. Oh, for that reason. See? Yeah. Let's get some pectic enzyme. All right. We are back and we have pectinase, also known as pectic enzyme. Use about a half teaspoon per gallon when you're making it. So that means after the fact, if you need to use it for clarifying purposes, you'd use a full teaspoon. So I'm just going to dump a teaspoon in here. And now we're using a full teaspoon in this part because we're kind of in the middle of making an ending. We're in the middle. Well, it's done fermenting for the most part. And what we're trying to do is just get a little bit more sugars out of the fruit so that it adds more flavors and maybe pushes it past that alcohol tolerance of the yeast really nicely and to help it clear just a little bit more because we did add some pectin. It did have a little bit of a haze already. Let's see what happens. We did also take a little sample taste uh, just to make sure everything was copacetic. It is super dry. It oh, is yeah. painfully it dry. It does not taste bad, but it is just a basic mead. Um, I did that off camera just to make sure that it wasn't, you know, <laughs> make sure that we didn't just waste five and a half pounds of peaches. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but um, yeah, the peaches should not float at this point. They're all very well um, soaked, so they're not gonna float. Except no, for that one that's being a pain. But if you hit them, they go back down. They're being brought up by the gases. Yeah, there's a lot of gas in here. Yeah, and that's why I just gave it a little stir. I'm gonna let those gases stay in there. We're gonna put the lid back on. Perfect that time. And give this oh, a Titan. And then I'm just going to swirl it ever so slightly. Not much because I don't want to. Yep. I just needed it to do that. Yeah. Just push some of that, those gases out to get the airlock going. That's it. So we added our peaches. What's sure the next step? Dry. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit because I never talk, right? I'm just as quiet as a little mouse over here. Um, Part of the things that you may be concerned about is that we didn't do anything to, to stabilize the fruit. Uh, I'm not using the right wor word, but... Sanitize the fruit. Sanitize the fruit. But the we did. The peaches were cleaned and they were frozen. They were frozen. And they were frozen in our chest freezer, which gets... Deep freeze. Yeah. It's a, it's a deep freeze. So it's not just stick it above your refrigerator freezer. It's You want them frozen, frozen, frozen. Because that way, it's going to kill off anything, Well, mostly. It doesn't really kill off everything, but it's a help, is all it is. It doesn't actually kill things, but it, it's a help. The alcohol that it's in right now is probably a bigger help, which it's that's the advantage to doing it the way we did. Kind of a one-two punch. It's they're, they're in a weakened state, and then we threw them into some alcohol. So it should be fine. If you're really concerned with it, you can use Camden tablets and, and clean them up that way if you want to. We didn't really enjoy the experience. We didn't. We didn't <laughs> so no. so no. we decided we're just not going to do it. We're going back to old school. Freezing has always worked for us, so that's what we're going to stick to. Exactly. Uh, but because they were frozen, and we did try to thaw them out a little bit, but more you outside. can feel this. It's it cold, is though. super cold. So Ooh, yeah. we know that yeast, any yeast that might still be in here, are going to go to sleep, most likely, if they're still active. Because the temperature change isn't going to kill them. It's just going to kind of make them chill. Haha, <laughs> pun intended. So if there is any sugars in here, and if they haven't reached their yeast alcohol tolerance, which they're very close to by the manufacturer's recommendation, they're not going to do anything right now. 
Give it a few days. But we're gonna let let it sit and maybe they won't. Because if this comes back to room temperature, they could wake back up. Yeah. But the thing is, we are stressing the yeast intentionally. Yeah. That's kind of what she's trying to say. By adding something very cold to this right away, at the end of fermentation, where it's so close to the tolerance, we're stressing those yeast, hoping that they just say, eh, it's not worth the trouble. Forget about it. And let it, it go. <laughs> but anyway, we're gonna give this a couple of weeks on the fruit. And since nothing is floating, it can sit like this almost indefinitely because there's nothing popping up to cause mold. We do have some degassing happening. This is perfectly set to sit for a few weeks to get as much flavor out of those peaches as possible. So we'll see you in a few weeks. It's been two weeks. It's been sitting on peaches all that time. As you can see, it's bubbling. I'm wondering if that's because I disturbed it a little bit, but let's get that lid off and find out. It is entirely possible that these peaches fermented a little bit more. In fact, I'm kind of betting they did. Nothing no, they, untoward. Yeah, there's nothing fuzzy. They do look they odd out. in color. That's completely normal. Any fruit that you ferment is going to leach its color into the brew and therefore become a different color. Well, as they stick out and, you know, I mean, they're still wet. We, I've been swirling a little bit, but uh, as they stick out, they oxidize too. So that's pretty normal. It's really hard to get past all the fruit. It's, it's turning to pulp. And I'm taking a gravity reading just to verify that everything's good. I don't think they leached much back in. It's it's gassy, so it definitely did uh, ferment a little bit more. Oh, look at that. They did actually drop some sugars in because we were at 0 0.996. Now it is actually at 1.12, 1.012. That's really interesting. So what does that mean? That means that it released some of the peaches, released their sugars into the brew but because we don't know how much sugar they did release into the brew, we can't tell you for certain how much was right. fermented, if any continued. Actually, we sorta of can. Give me a minute. Using the calculator the teacher said I would never have handy, not only am I gonna figure out the ABV of what we might have gained, I'm even gonna calculate how much sugar there was in the peaches. A little program called Chronometer. Okay, so we put in five and a half pounds of peaches. This isn't gonna be exact because everything has to be estimated slightly, but I can figure out there are 209 grams of sugars in that five and a half pounds of peaches, peaches. right? So 209 grams, that is 0.46 pounds. So if we go off of the 0 0.046 gravity per pound, they could have added up to 21 points of gravity. That's 0 0.021. Yeah, point, point 0.021. So 0 0.996 plus 0 0.021 is 1.017. It went to 1.012, which means we gained 2.16% ABV. And it ended sweet. Because here's what happened. This has surpassed the alcohol tolerance of the yeast. Okay, we thought it might, but it actually totally did. So essentially we step fed it just a little bit, but let me add, let me add that 2% to my list. So that's 15.9% ABV right now, approximately, because we don't know if all the sugars came out. We don't know, you know, did it all get consumed? We don't know. That's in a perfect world, it went up that much. So if we say it's somewhere between 14 and 16%, we're, we're safe. Um, but for now, I want to, this is, this has goop in it. Yeah, we're gonna have to rack this multiple times. Okay. okay, so. So you're just gonna hold up, cause I gotta get the, get the pitcher or the, okay. the. The fermenter. The fermenter. That. All right, so we have our closed mouth fermenter and I'm just gonna take the sample and pour most of it in here. There's some goop, there's some stuff. We're gonna deal with that, don't worry. What's really interesting to me is that we surpassed the yeast tolerance and it left it a little bit sweet. That little bit of sweetness might actually mean we don't have to do much to this. So I'm curious, but I'm gonna take a taste. I'm not overly thrilled with the smell, but the taste has peach. The taste is actually not bad, not bad at all. Wow. Yeah, even as it is, so. But anyway, we are going to rack this now. And I'm gonna leave the cap on because there's a lot of stuff in here. I just don't want all that in my brew, even though, as Derek said, we're gonna have to rack this multiple times, I would imagine. It's very fizzy, which means it did ferment some more. Kind of crazy. As you're racking, if you tilt like this, 
you can get a little bit more of the liquid in the corner, and that way um, you don't get as much goop when you're racking. This also brings up an interesting thing that people get concerned with. There's always a certain amount of waste when you're making any kind of homebrew. There's going to be sediment, there's going to be stuff like that. We already had some lees waste because of the fermentation process, and now we're kind of doing a second fermentation. And, well, we have all this fruit. What are we going to do with the fruit? We're Probably... going to put it in the composter. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to compost it. It's mush, basically. I mean, some people might try to bake with it or something, but for us, it's compost fodder. So we just want to put a bung or a stopper and an airlock on this. I'm gonna put our notes back on in just a moment, but I wanna talk about this a little bit. There was a lot of gases coming out of this. So this is going to degas, okay? It needs a little bit of time. We're gonna let this sit for probably a week, maybe two, to fully degas. Then we're gonna check it again, just to make sure it's not still actually fermenting because it could be. And when you go past the yeast tolerance that way, it's always good to double and triple check to make sure. Because if we were to bottle this right away and it was still fermenting, we could have a serious pressure problem, and um, that would be a bottle bomb down the line. We don't want that to happen. Even though there was residual sweetness thanks to our friends the peaches, I feel like this potentially could have just a little bit more. So we're probably going to do some flavor adjustments in a while as well. Yes, but for now, we're going to let it sit, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. All right, we got all the stuff out today. Why? This thing's still fermenting. It's... There's bubbles coming up the sides. It's crazy. I mean, here's a, here's some bubbles coming up the side footage for you. As you can see, it's acting like it's still fermenting. There was only 12 points of sugars left in this because we racked off the fruit. So first thing I want to do is take a reading and see where it's at, see what is going on. With our last check, we found out that it was fermenting again, and I realized that some of the peaches could have leached some, some juices out that started fermenting, but we were already really close to the tolerance of the yeast. Cote de Blancs only goes 12 to 14 percent. Blanc, not Blancs. You don't say the S in French, sorry. Um, and I figured out that even with the gravity that was at 1.012, that it's probably in like the 15 to almost 16 percent range, which is beyond the alcohol tolerance of the yeast. So, you know, further proof, yeast can't read, but here we are still going. That's kind of shocking. A little bit annoying because we've had enough stalls that I'm like, why didn't you do this on the other one? <laughs> Curses! <laughs> yeast can't read and they don't cooperate, uh, apparently. I think they're being obnoxious. Oh, it did go down some. We're sitting at 1.004. So it went down another eight points. Okay, I just, I just have to figure this out. Using the calculator, teacher said I would never have handy. It was right there. I saw it out of the corner of my eye. It was totally within view the whole time. So 1.012 minus 1.004 times 135. We got, that's another percentage to this. So this is like 16 to 17% now. This is becoming nuts. I've, we've not seen this kind of thing happen very often. No. However, we're going to put an end to it right here That's right. today because I don't need it to go any higher. Crazy yeasties, we're done with you. Right. So I have this. It looks pretty clean. Okay. We are going to rack it to a pitcher. I'm just going to pour this right into the pitcher right now so I don't disturb anything because there is lees in the bottom there. Leaving the cap on. Why? I felt like it. there's some pieces in here. I don't want them into our brew. So there we go. All right, so we have finished racking into our pitcher. Our outer siphon did suck up some of those little bits, bits and pieces. We'll use cheesecloth when we rack it next time. And we're going to pasteurize it, which we know from experience makes things settle out again, so it should be no big deal. But now comes the moment of truth. Does it taste like peach? And will I like it? So we're going to do our typical sweetening routine, which is we smell it, taste it, add honey. 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 Until we go, hey, this is good. Then we're going to pasteurize it because this is still an active fermentation. Who knows how much further this yeast will go. I feel like it tastes better than it smells. Yep. I feel like it tastes a lot better than I thought it was going to. Chunk or no, I'm doing the last. All right. I just, I was. There is a very distinct peach flavor. I did not expect that. It's it's like a cooked peach. The peaches that we have available to us right now are fantastic. I've been eating peaches like a crazy person. And she doesn't so... really eat peaches. I do. And I'm not a peach person. That's but... the weird thing. I like peaches. Yeah. I eat a lot of peaches. I don't like peach alcohol. 
However, this is not bad. I think it needs some sweetening. I agree. So, sweetening we go. And if you're wondering why we don't measure, it's because it's so much easier to just tell you at the end we are at this kind of gravity rather than trying to weigh it out and figure it out and all that kind of stuff. It just gets a little crazy. Do we realize that we are diluting this slightly by adding some honey? Yes, but it's at 17%, so it can dilute a little bit. I'm okay with that. All these things that we have out, of course, have been sanitized, because you should sanitize all your equipment before you use it, right? If you don't, please do. Every once in a while, somebody tells me, I don't clean anything, I don't sanitize anything, I keep them in the backyard in a bucket and throw it all together, and I've never had an infection. Okie dokie. I always say, yet. I mean, here's the thing. It's not a guarantee that you're not going to get an infection, just as much as it's not a guarantee if you don't sanitize that you're going to get an infection. It's just good practice. Why? And for all the people that like to say, oh, well, you know, the Vikings didn't have sanitization. Yeah, the Vikings drank a lot of really bad mead, too, because I'm pretty sure even if it got infected, they drank it. Didn't they even sometimes throw meat into the... They threw all sorts of stuff into it. Bucket. I think they added things to cover up the infection taste. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Think about it. If you have a straight up mead and it gets infected and you throw a bunch of fruit into it, it'll cover up that, that taste, right? Sure, sure. Throw more honey in it. Make it sweeter. It'll cover it up. Sure I guarantee meat, you. Meat's going to add to the I don't know either. Party. That part, I, I was trying to ignore that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the meat really adds much to, the, to a mead. <laughs> Other than they sort of sound kind of alike, doesn't mean they taste good together. So I don't know what the Danish word for meat, meat is. I don't know either. All right, so that's mixed in. Give it another taste. Now, the thing about honey is honey adds its own flavor, but it's also a flavor intensifier, just like sugar, because sweetness and saltiness both enhance flavors. On the smell, it's still a little bit harsh on the smell, and Probably that's just a honey. yeah. Well, I'm not done yet. Ooh. Definitely getting more peach now, though. Way more peach coming through. Mm -hmm. You taste that? Mm -hmm. It's like, it was cooked peach before, now it's starting to become fresh peaches. More honey! We will give a reading at the end so that you can replicate what we did. And, you know, how do I know how much to add? I don't, I'm, I'm guessing, okay? I'm not adding too much at a time on purpose because you can always put more in, but it, it's really hard to take it back out. This is also degassing it a little bit because there was plenty of gas in this from still being, you know, an active fermentation pretty much. So that's why we're gonna pasteurize this at the end. Just in case it felt like going further, we're gonna pasteurize it. That'll kill off the yeast. It'll stop the fermentation process. It's not something I recommend for a truly, like at the peak active fermentation, but it is a method. Um, I just, af I'm afraid of geysers. All right, so another method, and I know this is going to come up in the comments, so I want to go ahead and nip that in the bud, is to continue to feed it sugars and let it just keep on going. Just yeah. let it go. The Until it stops. The eventually. reason why we didn't do that and we cognitively made a decision, we are not going to do this, is because we were concerned that the continuation of fermentation was actually going to reduce the flavor of peach. Yep. Because if you remember, we added peach after we fermented. We didn't anticipate it to continue to ferment. And if you also remember, peach is my nemesis. It's yeah. never worked out for me. I've never made something that I liked that was peach. So I really didn't want this to go to super sky high alcohol and then have to contend with that right. as a flavor profile too. Okay, honey's coming through a little bit more on the, on the smell. That's becoming a very nice peach mead. It is. I think just a touch sweeter and we got it. It has. Peach has an unusual flavor because it, it's not exactly a super sweet all the time. It kind of has a little, almost an under t undercurrent of, I don't want to say bitter, but oh, it's like the a- the end is lovely though. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah the yeah, finish yeah. on this is fantastic. I'm I, excited. Just a little bit more honey and I think we got it. Going to have to clean that off. That, yeah. You can't, every time you put the lid back on, I'm like, why are you putting the lid back on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's just mess. squirting out the sides. Yeah, and then the first time down, I'm sure my expression was caught on camera. I'm, I'm pretty sure that they saw it too, because if I see it, I'll enlarge that in editing. So all you see is Darka's face. Yeah.
I have a question for you guys, and I've asked before in the community tab, but I'm going to ask the people who are really watching, still watching this video, by the way. Um, we've tried many different ways of editing our videos. And what I mean by that is not length of video or how many parts go into a video. What I mean is like B-roll. What B-roll is, is when you see like a graphic or another set of video that isn't necessarily ours, but or it's from another time or something like that dropped in. And there are times and places for it that are 100% necessary. Like I showed the carbonation earlier, the, the bubbles coming out the side, that's considered B-roll. But sometimes I'll do it for effect. And we've had compliments and complaints both ways. Now, I'm trying to figure out what works best for our audience, which is you guys, the people watching right now, the ones that are actually watching the video. And I don't want to know what you think other people think. I want to know what you think. Do you prefer it when it's just us and we're doing our thing and, you know, I, I put in just our real footage? Or do you like seeing the semi-comical stuff? Because I have to be a little bit careful too. Some of that can be copyrighted. So I'm trying to be safe about it as well. So yeah, that's where I'm at. So I'm, I was just curious if anybody had any thoughts on that. Okay, on the smell now, I'm definitely getting a little bit more honey character. A little bit of peach, but it's still kind of a muted smell. That's nice. That's really nice. I, I think I am happy with this as is, ready for pasteurization. Now, we also know that pasteurizing will mellow those tones just a tiny bit sometimes. So it's either gonna be like this or slight, slightly better melded. But what I wanna do is give you guys a reading on this to give you an idea where it's at. And the idea behind a reading rather than a measurement is, right now we have a little over 128 ounces. What if you have a little under 128 ounces? If you put in exactly the amount of poundage or grams or whatever volume of weight that we put in, you're gonna get a different result. So giving you the gravity reading means there's something to shoot for. You could just add until you get that gravity reading and then you're good to go. I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna guess we went up to like a 1.020, uh, 1.022. And now's the moment when you find out how good I am or bad I am. Okay, I was off by two points. It's 1.024. <laughs> I mean, you see it, right? I, I see it. Just a weird thing that I am able to do. All right, so to me, that makes this sweet, but peaches should be sweet. Dry peaches, I think that's why I haven't liked many things that were peaches, they were dry. When peach comes across dry to me, it doesn't taste like peach anymore. Now it's just like this nasty thing. I don't know what to make of it. So making this on the sweet side actually works. What we're going to do now, though, is we are going to actually rack this into a, another fermenter. We're going to pasteurize it. We do have a video on pasteurization. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it'll just make this video be two hours long instead of one hour long. But we do have a video on that. And we'd like to use a sous vide immersion circulator to do it. And I will link it in the description below so that way you can watch that video if you're unfamiliar with our pasteurization practices. Then we're going to let it sit for probably a week, maybe two. It'll probably clear out a little bit more. Some of that stuff will fall out. We'll be back to give you our first impressions tasting with a score. This is the tasting sound. It was nicer when you first did it, then it just got all... Okay, so it's been like a week. This has not really cleared more. Sometimes that happens. We, we've seen this with back sweetening, that there's times that sometimes it just will not clear afterwards. However, is it clear enough? Yeah. yeah. It's not like soup. It's, you know, it, it, it's it's not opaque. I actually enjoy the color. I, it reminds me of peach. Yeah. I mean, looking at this in the glass, it's got such a mild haze. Like, I would still call that like an eight on the clarity scale. Yeah. In the jug, jug in the fermenter, it actually looks a lot more murky. I didn't say that nicely at all. <laughs> one of the more awkward statements I think I've ever made. But anyway, yeah, a clarity level, it's like a seven to an eight. Okay, so it's pretty close to clear. I don't have any problem with that. On the smell, slight amount of young funk. Yeah. Um, not too bad, but a little bit. Definitely getting an alcohol smell, which this is the one that this is like 16%. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So there's a little <laughs> bit of an ethanol. Definitely getting a fruity punch, though, um, right off the smell. Yeah. And I, I was never a big fan of peaches, but lately, like lately, I mean, this week lately, I've been full on into peaches. And it has occurred to me, peaches really don't have a very peachy smell. 
No, they really don't. They're they're all about flavor. They're not a lot really of people so much actually, about smell. A lot of people actually will add apricot to get a peach flavor uh, out of things and a smell because apricots are a little more a stronger smell. Yeah. All right, so let's get in there. Yeah. Um, this before I taste it, I'm going to say something. We did sweeten this to 1.024, so this is like medium sweet. Um, it should be uh, quite nice. That's a damn good peach mead. Yeah, it is. Woohoo! We've conquered the nemesis. Yeah, that is. <laughs> it's definitely got a honey forward with a nice peach tone to it. It's it's not super complex. It's got like three or four notes, but those are strong notes. They're they're good notes. They're 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 excellent notes. They're excellent. They're the best notes. I can't believe I made a peach something that was good. <laughs> it's really nice. And it's got all the things you want from a peach beverage. It even has that mouthfeel that reminds you of soft... If you have soft canned peaches. Fuzziness. Canned yeah. peaches. Did you ever, did you ever have canned peaches? Mm. They have like that, almost a, a thick, but there's like a, like a caramely kind of thing going mm -hmm. on. Not quite cooked, but it's like there's a... A little bit of, oh, I don't want to say bitter, because it's not really bitter, but there's a flavor, there's a, a texture almost that they have. It comes through in this. It comes through wonderfully. It's very nice, very nice. Uh, but because my mind does things. What? Because that's what minds do. I'm immediately like, oh, well, now that we've done peach, we need to do a fuzzy navel. I am actually not against that. Because now that we've done the peach, yeah. One thing... I did learn this, just one of our, um, Stephen Patrick, one of our viewers told me, we've been using mandarins because mandarin oranges, they're sweeter, right? However, the peels have more bitter agents in the peel than they do in the fruit. So if we do a fuzzy navel, we may actually use mandarins, but use the fruit to keep it sweet, or but not use the peel, or use regular orange peels, orange. or maybe um, both. Yeah. But that's, yeah. that's another video. It is. But, but, but hey, we did peach. It came out peachy. Life's good. Interestingly enough, I mean, just looking through here, we have some wine tannin added to this. We is wildflower, honey, fermato. Uh, it was Cote de Blanc yeast, which we're having really good luck with lately. I think we have a good batch. I think what has happened is it's so hot that the trucks that are delivering yeast back and forth from wherever we get a lot of our stuff from Amazon. Yeah. It might be sitting in them too long. It could be sitting in warehouses that aren't air conditioning. So... I think that's what's been going on because it just seemed like we had five or six brews in a row that yep. all stalled. Some of them, there was just no reason why it should have. So I'm thinking maybe the yeast were damaged in some way. It's possible. I'm not blaming that because, hey, you know, things happen. Right. And so we always put links to all of our ingredients and all of our, all of our tools in the description below to help you yep. find those items. But particularly for heat sensitive stuff such as yeast. If you have a homebrew local yeah. to you, a homebrew store, uh, see if they have the yeast that we're using because they might be getting their shipment directly from the producer. Yeah, so they're still shipping be, too, but it, but might, it might be- But it might be chilled, it might be temperature regulated. Yeah, there, there could be more controls in place than getting it yeah. direct from Amazon. Right. If you do not have the option, well, then you just take your chances. We have some yeast that are questionable right now. I'm not sure. Yeah. We may try them just to test them, um, but some of that might be off camera even because I don't want to waste a video right? and then have it stall and then everybody's like, oh, you guys don't know what you're doing. Well, another option <laughs> is if all you have is Amazon to get the yeast that you're looking for is to wait, if possible, to cooler months, Yeah. order a bunch and keep it in your fridge. Yep. That's what we always did. Yep. That way you don't have to worry about them being affected by and the I heat. Think that's why like the Cote de Blancs and, and stuff like that is still good because yeah. that was purchased a year ago. Yeah. At least a year ago. Yep. So. Whereas the 71B that we used a bunch of times was just purchased in the last couple of months. I'm so happy we, we got a peach. She's yes. to be peach. Peach, yeah, peach, she's, peach. She's getting me back to, on, on subject. That's what that is. She's very good at doing that. It doesn't usually last long, but she's good at doing it. So yeah, on the uh, experience for this one, it comes into the mouth. I want to say ever so slightly watery. Just, just a, a touch just, just watery. Just a skosh. But then that like fullness of peach comes through with the honey. Yep. And it really does taste like canned peaches with honey poured on top. Yep. 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 I'm I'm just I'm tickled peach. 
peach. Aha. And then uh, there's a good brightness to it. There's just enough acidity to really wake it up in your mouth. It's It's got a nice brightness without being like harsh. Um, it doesn't have a strong tannic quality. We might have been able to add a little bit more wine tannin to this, but I'm not complaining because I don't think it needs it, but we could have made it slightly more tannic. What are you doing? I'm doing a thing. You gotta do numbers first. Oh shoot, numbers. Numbers before mixing, it's a rule. Oh, All it's right. Okay, it's and that's, that's staying in the edit too. I'm not removing that's it. Fine. That's fine, that's <laughs> fine. I'm a so, human being. So we uh, we had this two numbering system thing made up and it was a big deal and we're trying to make it more diminutive. So basically we're gonna give like a repeatability score and then we're gonna give what we really think of it. So the repeatability score, we're just gonna agree on. So the situation say, was, How did it, work? it just did its thing, right? There wasn't really that big of a deal. The just... only thing that it did was it fermented more when the peaches got added after it went past right, the yeast tolerance. Right. Does that mean it's not repeatable for other people? I don't know, but I'm gonna give it a nine. Okay. I don't think I, it's a 10 because of agree. that. It could make things a little bit difficult to repeat. So I think a nine mm, is, I can, is pretty I can solid. agree with that. Yep. So if you're a beginner, this is still a great thing to try because it's pretty easily repeatable. You might just not get to the same ABV that we did. And that's not really a problem. It'll probably taste better without as much sweetness. So yeah. keep that into account too. Yeah. As for enjoyment though, hmm, wow, that's, Mm. It's just nice. It's just easy yeah, drinking. It really it's, is. it's But I'm just comparing it to other things that we've made. Um someone asked recently, did our meads get worse after a year? Because our scores are generally lower on the one year than they were at the new. Derica has a theory on this, and then there, there's another part to it. Her theory is, when it's fresh and new, we're all, oh, we just made this, and it's like our baby. So the tendency is to want to score it higher. We try not to, but it, we're human, you know, it, it happens. The other thing is, we are constantly learning and constantly uh, consolidating and fine-tuning our senses and our palates, and as I say, learning. So it only makes sense that our scores would actually get a little lower over time for the same product. So it is entirely possible that it's better than it was a year ago when we do a one year tasting, but because of our palate being a little more refined and a we're little more knowledgeable, more particular. we're more particular on it. So we scored it lower than we did. That doesn't mean it's bad, okay? The, the thing is, you cannot say, oh, well, you gave it a 7.5 here and an 8 here, or a 7.5 here and a 7 here, and say that that's a huge difference. Yeah, basically, if it's above that's a the five, same thing. it's good. Yeah, so. we could probably do a 1 to 3 scale and yeah. be fine, yeah. to be honest with you. <laughs> but I don't want to do that to Adam. Adam went through all of our videos and made up the spreadsheet, and Derek had just compiled it together to upload for the uh, the score sheet of Doom, that's the scorecard on our website. Yeah. There's a link to it in the description. Yeah. Um, I don't want to do that to Adam because he'd have to go through and figure out like divide by three and all that kind of thing. <laughs> no, we're yeah, not, I'm not no, doing that to him. Although maybe someday we will change it. Stick into what's yeah. working. Okay, so I I'm thinking of a number. I have a number, but I need more beverage so I can do my mad scientist cocktail <sighs> for later because we have to do numbers first. Yep. Do you have a number? I do. One, two, three, eight. eight. <laughs> I was debating between eight and eight point five. I figured eight was a good place because it's like a I solid said, score. It's a solid beverage too. It's it's a peach mead, and it and it, I'm getting the peach, I'm getting the honey, and it's really easy to drink. Other than that, there's not a lot going on. And if you're if it's you're a used, fairly simple, if mead. you're used to me the, to the Derica, <laughs> is know, anyone used to you? I'm, I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm kind of a complicated, wacky gal, and I like complexity, and so this... I mean, she uses the term gal. <laughs> Who does that? So, um, that's the only reason why I knocked it down to an eight, is because it's it's simple, and I like things complicated. That's why she likes me. <laughs> but I went with eight because of this. Eight is smack perfectly in the middle of, I'm going down the shelf, yeah, I'll drink that, and I want this. 
It's right in the middle because this is not the kind that I would say, oh yeah, I want that. And it's also not the kind that I would forget about. So yep. it, it's the kind that I might be like, oh, you know what? I'm kind of in the mood for that peach mead today. Yep. But it's not an everyday thing. This is a little bit more of an experience, even though it's simple. It is actually more like you don't want to just have this casually with a meal. It, it It's not going to meld with a lot of things that way. I just tried to do ever so slightly. You saw that, right? That wasn't ever so slightly. Can you swirl for me? Sure. You got to give me two so I can do it with both hands. Oh, it's, it smells good already. I mean, it smelled good it does. before, but now it smells even better. But now you've, you're have you kind of making a fuzzy navel. I'm kind of making a fuzzy navel. We can work on making our own Cointreau, you know. Mm. Actually, mm. Yeah. <laughs> Who does that sound like? It's good. But I think for a fuzzy navel, something else is missing. Vodka? <laughs> might be. There's a sharpness that's missing. Um, might need more acid if we make a fuzzy Maybe navel. Maybe like lime or something. I don't know about lime. I wouldn't want lime. Maybe lemon. Lemon. But definitely some more acid. Like an acid blend in there would probably help a little bit. Citric. Maybe a citric acid? I don't know. But that's a whole other recipe. We will figure that one out. In the meantime... This came out really, really nice. If you like peaches and you want to make a pretty simple fruit mead, this is the way to go. It worked out really, really well. It's, it's almost a foolproof recipe. It's very difficult to mess up the way we did it. Just keep that in mind. And if you have any problems as you're making this, as always, just ask away. We tend to get to every single comment that people ask. We try to anyway. Um, we are just human and, you know, it is just a system. That every once in a while, it throws a comment at me, and I'm like, how did this get Where through? Did I didn't even from? see it. I check them all the time, but every once in a while, something slips through. So if your comment slips through, just ask away again. Don't, don't get mad at me for not responding to you. Just ask again. Um, but anyway, as always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and have a great day. Bye-bye.